Welcome to Be With Champions. I'm your host, Greg Bennett. And in today's episode, I have a wonderful conversation with Dr. Mansoor Mohammed. It was just incredibly educational and insightful. And Dr. Mansoor describes what is functional genomics and, and why and how we can all learn so much more about ourselves by using it. And he uses my recent DNA results as an example, just to show findings and and how I can make the most of my genetic profile. And I'd honestly encourage you all to look into it you know, for yourselves. And this was not a sponsorship. I did go and pay for this myself, as did Laura and the rest of our, our family. Um, they did give me a page on their website that you can go to and get 10% off. Um, so if you want to go to mydnacompany.com forward slash products forward slash Greg, again, that's www.com mydnacompany.com forward slash products forward slash Greg, and you can get 10% off there. Um, some housekeeping before we go on, please share and subscribe. Uh, you're doing me a huge favor there. You can go to your podcast app of choice and subscribe. Really appreciate it. Keep that feedback coming. Um, you can do that either on social media where I'm uh, on Instagram, I'm Greg Bennett World, on Twitter, I'm Greg Bennett One, and then, of course, on Facebook and LinkedIn, uh, I'm just Greg Bennett, and you can look me up there, and, and I will get back to you the best I can, so I really appreciate that. Keep it coming. For the show notes and timestamps and the coupon links, and if you want more information on mydnacompany.com, you'll be able to find all of that in the show notes at bennettendurance.com forward slash media that's bennettendurance.com forward slash media all right enjoy the show guys i I really did before we start i've got to give a quick shout out to the brands that make this show possible the only brands i'm working with are brands that provide products that i use daily and truly believe in these products support my immunity they help improve my recovery and my focus first up my friends at athletic greens I love this company and I love their all-in-one daily drink. It's become a part of my morning routine. I'm heavily focused on supporting my immunity and boosting my energy and and helping my gut health, but I want to do it naturally. And I found that support with Athletic Greens, a whole food sourced green drink that tastes great and there's no hassle. It's delivered straight to your door. And it's a highly absorbable powder that takes seconds to mix with water so there's no clumpiness to deal with. I can't believe a green drink sourced from Whole Foods can actually taste so good. Personally, I truly love it. It's developed from a complex blend of 75 vitamins and minerals. It's packed with aptogens for recovery, probiotics and digestive enzymes for gut health, and vitamin C and zinc citrate for immune support. So Athletic Greens is designed to help fill the nutritional gaps in your diet. And there's a great offer going on now for you to give it a try. Simply go to athleticgreens.com forward slash Greg to claim our special offer of 20 free daily travel packets with your first order. $79 added value and get Athletic Greens delivered straight to your door. Again, that's athleticgreens.com forward slash Greg. This show is also brought to you by my friends at Hyperice. Some of these products I've been using for almost a decade. Makers of the award-winning Hypervolt, the world's most powerful percussion massage device featuring quiet glide technology. Hyperice is a wellness tech company that makes devices designed to help you move better. From handheld massage devices to vibrating foam rollers, thermal technology, and the Normatec compression systems, Hyperice helps you warm up faster, recover quicker, and simply move better. Used in professional training rooms throughout the NBA, the NFL, MLB, the MLS, Ironman, and other professional organizations for well over a decade designed to help improve circulation, flexibility, and relieve tension. Get $50 off all percussion devices now, no code needed, and get an additional 10% off with code GREG10 at hyperice.com. That's hyperice.com, H-Y-P-E-R-I-C-E.com, and use code GREG10 for 10% off. All right. I have an incredible guest today. He's widely regarded as a pioneer and recognized authority in the fields of medical genomics and personalized medicine. And he's the holder of several patents in the general fields of molecular diagnostics and genomics research. He's the founder and chief science officer at the DNA Company. And I'm just honored to have him on Be With Champions to tell us a bit about what is functional genomics and then to discuss my DNA results from my recent test. And we'll find out soon if I chose the right career path for the past, uh, what, 30 years. So thank you and welcome to the show, Dr. Mansoor Muhammad. 
What a privilege. How are you? I'm great, uh, Greg, and it's a, it, it is my privilege to be on the show. So thank you for having me. Now, I, I just want to kind of get right into it because for a lot of us, uh, it's like, well, hang on, what is this functional genomics? What is DNA? What are we really talking about? And I've been kind of preaching for quite a while now that I think the future of high performance, high performance sport is really identifying what our passions are, but then aligning them with our strengths. And I think aligning them with our strengths and understanding our strengths, if we really go to the core of it, is DNA. <laughs> and, and, and this is your specialty. Um, so there's a couple of questions in here I want to ask. Firstly, I think your background and how you got to this point of uh, basically being a world leader in, the, in this whole, whole field. And then secondly, telling us a little bit about what uh, functional genomics is. Absolutely. I came, to, I came to this field of functional genomics via the equally tantalizing field of transgenics. So those were the heady days where we were trying to take human genes when we were isolating genes being, of course, those discrete instructions. So let's dial it back just a little bit. The genome, this is the operating manual of the organism in question, the human being and any other living uh, matter for that, for that matter. And so within that operating manual, and that's a perfectly adequate analogy, it's an actual manual. Within that manual, as per any other manual, there's a language, the language of the manual, and the coding of that language of that manual. And that is what DNA is. DNA is the coding uh, material, the coding approach for the operations, i.e. the genes that cumulatively comprise your genome. So the human genome is a collection of 22,000 odd genes, and it's more than just the genes, okay? But those 22,000 odd instructions, each one of them might be viewed as a paragraph on the thousands upon thousands of pages of the human genome, okay? And DNA is the language that encodes that entire operating manual. So I cut my teeth, Greg, in the heady days where we were studying human genes, and we wanted to better understand these genes as standalone. So what we would do is we'd take a human gene, a gene of some particular importance, and we would put it in an animal model. So we would literally transpose, i.e. trans, hence the transgenics. We would take the human gene, put it in an animal model, and we would see how that animal model behaved. And the reason I mention this is for two, two purposes. It really struck with me the awe. Here was... This operating manual, you could take an instruction from a human being, and, and I know our guests and our audience and you, you, might, you yourself might laugh at this, my chosen animal, my model, would, was chickens. I would take human genes, and this is, I'm not making this up, I have patents on this, and I would put them into hens, into chickens. But, but the reason I mention this is for two things. The, the awe that was struck in me when I realized I could take an a paragraph, an instruction from a human operating manual, put it into the chicken operating manual, and then that chicken would know, quote unquote, how to read that human paragraph. And the point of this is it highlights the universality of DNA. So this was the first thing that just, you know, I fell in love with the whole concept of genetics and DNA. This was the work that I did during one of my PhDs. The second reason I mentioned this is, as I just described, I was taking individual genes, putting them into complex systems and watching at how these genes would behave. And so that really led me to an understanding that in order to interpret any DNA manual, whether it's from the chicken, whether it's to human being, and let's stick with human beings henceforth, <laughs> we... We had to understand the manual as a whole. We had to understand the DNA, and I'll end with this. DNA, Greg, is a language just like any other language. And what does this mean? You know, Greg, if you're trying to master a language, which is what you need to do in order to read a book written in that language, so in order to read the human operating manual, you've got to master the language of DNA. 
And when you master a language, given that I just said the DNA is as much a language as any other language, spoken language that you can think of, there are a couple of attributes of a, of a language, and there are a couple of attributes of mastering that language. The first is vocabulary. Of course, one must know the vocabulary. And here, the analogy of vocabulary is the discrete genes. And we see this mastery in many other approaches to DNA, i.e. there's an excellent recording of human genes. What are those genes? Where are those genes? What do those genes do? And that is fundamental to mastering a language. Genes here being the vocabulary of the language of DNA. Great. However, what has been missing in the field of genetics, and this is what we do a bit differently, is beyond vocabulary for the mastery of a language, because we just said the genome, DNA, it's a language. So beyond the mastery, for the mastery of a language, beyond vocabulary, there is grammar, there is syntax, there are the nuances of a language that you've got to know. And believe it or not, Greg, all of those things apply when studying DNA and when studying the genome of a human being. It's not just the genes, which is the vocabulary or other vocabulary pieces. It's how do the genes come together, the grammar of the language of DNA of the human operating manual, the syntax, the nuances. Once you do that, once you have beyond the vocabulary, you understand the grammar, you understand how the sentences and the paragraphs and the volumes are written for the human genome, then what you're able to tap, now you've become fluent in that language. Now you can really go to that book to the human genome, read it with intelligence, interpret it with intelligence, and get something that is awesomely meaningful. Mm. Is that what the specialty of, of the, the DNA company that you founded? Is that what you guys are kind of separating yourselves from doing better than everybody else? Absolutely. I mean, you know, it's, 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 it's sort of full-headed way. Uh, obviously, that's our approach. And, and so, yes, this is what we've done you know, not saying that there aren't other amazing approaches to understanding DNA, but what we've done mm. far more holds it from a holistic perspective is what I've said. When we study genes and when we consult, as your audience will hear shortly, when we consult with our patients, with our executives, our, our athletes, we're not just talking about individual genes. We're talking about how these genes come together so that it's operational. This is the functionality. This is why this is functional genomics. And yes, this is what we do differently than I think most others. I, I got to sort of touch on the fact of how did we sort of come together here? Because probably about three or four months ago, um, my wife, Laura, was saying, I'm doing this, you know, I'm doing this test. I'm doing this DNA test. And I, I'm always the slow to the to the take on all of these things. It might be the Australian in me or the cynic. I don't know what it is, but I'm like, okay, whatever, Laura, off you go. And, and she spent her money and did this test. And she was so busy breastfeeding our little one that she didn't have time to get on a call with you to hear her results. So you kindly spent 45 minutes to an hour and you recorded all her results and what you saw. Now, up until this point, I was just like, okay, Laura's testing something out, whatever. <laughs> and then she said, well, Greg, why don't you go, you know, listen to it for 45 minutes or whatever. And so I did. And I sat down and I listened to you describe Laura to the point that you could have saved me 20 years of heartache and marriage <laughs> because it was spot on, not just, yes, physically, um, but when we, you know, mentally and emotionally that I, I just couldn't get over it. And that's why I quickly went and, you know, bought my test and, and, uh, and said, right, would you come on to my podcast and read it out? Just so people understand where I'm coming from, because for me, what you did with Laura, the first thing I said um, to Laura is, They've got to start a dating app because this is amazing. <laughs> this, this could this could really help people with a lot of finding the right partner. Uh, okay, so firstly, have you thought about having a, a dating app? <laughs> <laughs> no, Greg, it's, it's funny that you mentioned. I don't it. want to make light of what you do, but it was something that crossed my mind. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it's 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 uh, there's a story to be told. There's some of the very first investors once they saw what we were doing 
of all of the things that I must admit, I, I was probably a tad bit full of myself because here it was, I was pouring my passion into talking about the amazing things that we can bring forth from the human genome. And this group of rather savvy investors, they listened to me, they digested it, they were awed and so on and so forth. And then the very first thing out of their mouths were, Dr. Mansur, we need to start a dating app with this group of <laughs> And I sat there and I looked really, of everything that I've said to you. <laughs> so, so actually, yes, Greg, that has been brought up. Oh, I, I just think it's fantastic. And that that's kind of what leads me into my, my next kind of, you know, dating apps and these kinds of things. It also got me thinking about high-performance sport. Um, you know, I've had some roles thrown at me in the past that said, Greg, we need you for talent ID, for, for triathlon and, and other events and other sports. Is that an area that you've spent any time in, um, looking specifically in high in the high performance sports world? It was, it is, and and quite at a degree. Although it was never my initial intention, I knew that once we tapped into the understanding of this operating manual, my goal has always just been what I would call health. You know, and and we could put all sorts of synonyms and adjectives to describe that. But I just wanted, I wanted to understand the human body, not the least of which because I, let's just say, I didn't inherit the best operating manual as much as I love my mom and dad. You know, I've got a few things wonky in my manual. So it was just, it was a passion play. And it was just something that coming from the medical world, I just wanted to understand, I wanted to understand the human body, full stop. Now, I knew that if I could do so, and to the degree that I can do so, clearly we could begin to understand well, or I thought we could begin to understand what would make a good athlete. And so it was not my first intention when I approached this field of functional genomics, but along the way, I've worked with, I've worked with Red Bull. I've worked with some of the best scientists there. I've worked with some of the leading athletes through that. We did an amazing study, an amazing study where anonymized, I was given the DNA of these, you know, this is the best of the best in each of their chosen fields. And the initial purport of the study was, could we pick up things, could we pick up telltale clues in the operating manual of these awesome, clearly, you know, the top 1% of the 1% of human beings when it comes to performance in their chosen craft? And we could probably leave that to comment on a little bit later, but let's just say, so yes, we did those studies. Yes, it was amazing. And we had some huge discoveries. They were not quite what we were expecting. They were far more important than what we were expecting, but it further taught me a lot. So the short answer to your question, Greg, absolutely, we have looked at the genomics of individuals within the high performance sector, and we have asked what might be telltale characteristics of these individuals. We've actually studied that in depth. Well, I guess my next question is, and I'm super excited because I, <laughs> I've been sort of hanging out for this uh, this chat with you for quite a few weeks now. Um, the next step is, I guess I, I need to know um, if I've got any of the telltale signs of being an athlete, uh, because that would answer my last 30 years. Um, I don't know what you know about me, actually, in terms of you know, you've come on my show. It's called Be With Champions. I, I interview uh, a, a lot of uh, Olympic and world champion athletes, amongst others, and then high performing, you know, doctors as yourself. Um, so I'm curious, though, as to see if we could probably start having a look at what my report says and, and maybe step through that. Um, and not only what it says, but perhaps some of the takeaways that I might be able to do to, to function a little bit better. <laughs> Brilliant. Could, could we do that now? I'd love to do it. Absolutely. And I mean, that, that's, that's everything we've said has been leading to this. And this is what <laughs> I've been looking forward to. Um, so to, to, let's get back to that very, very first part of your question. And that is, were there, or the, 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 the hint it, were there some of these telltale signs, some of these telltale scripts within the human genomic manual that seem to show up more and more in high performance athletes. So the first, the answer to that is there are telltale scripts. And as I, I hinted earlier, or I actually said earlier, we found some of those, but some of these, some of these, these, these uh, scripts, some of these, the, the components of these high performance athletes and the 
the pathways that we were looking for that we thought, okay, you know what? They're probably going to have the most awesome sex steroidal pathways where they will probably see a preponderance of androgenization because after all, we understand what androgens do to the cells of the body and how they change gene expression and what they do to musculature. So we thought, I thought somewhat naively initially was I was going to see that as a prominent phenomena and other things that I predicted. Well, I'm happy to say that some of the things I predicted were true, some of them were not. And coming back now to the answer to your question, we see that equal diaspora, and we see actually, and so for all of the audience members out there, Greg has, and he asked that question, who he alluded to it earlier in the conversation, had he chosen the right path? And I'll say, and I'll start with this, Greg, had you not chosen this path of high performance in your particular new chosen field, you probably were not going to be a very happy camper, number one. Number two, you would probably exhibit some fairly uh, telltale addictive tendencies and potentially even be in the down and the blues tendencies. In other words, you would never survive as a desk jockey. You would never survive being an accountant counting money for someone else. <laughs> and that's well, that's a good relief. <laughs> You know, and it, it sounds a little bit like a crystal ball reading, but let's get to the science behind that. So here's here are the answers to what are these telltale scripts? What are these telltale signs within the human genome that we see time and time again in athletes? We're going to go through that for Greg, for you, and we'll see that some of them makes all the sense in the world. And some of them, one in particular, has continued to befuddle me as to why does this continuously show up in the genome of high-performance athletes. So, okay, let's start with some of the more, what we would call obvious things. And sure enough, we saw that in Greg. What am I speaking of here? I'm speaking of the fact that if you're going to be a high-performance athlete and you're going to demand of your body physical exertion to the level that the rest of us mere mortals don't or can't, you're going to be demanding or you're going to be exposing your body to extreme oxidative stress, extreme oxidative stress as a direct downstream of the, the, you know, the rigors that you're putting the body through. Okay? Because as we demand, as those muscles are being taxed and moved, we are, we are burning our food sources to create energy. And the natural byproduct of that energy production, which clearly we need for performance, are oxidative byproducts, superoxidants for that matter. Okay? And so what do we tend to see repeatedly in individuals? And here we're speaking particularly those ultra- you know, ultra marathoners, these, these, not just the, you know, sprint runners or weightlifters per se, but individuals that are taxing their bodies at the longitudinal level. And what we saw in Greg, and so for the listeners out there that, uh, you know, particularly your audience that know you, Greg, you have actually, Greg, what we would call you are in the top two to three percent of all human beings when it comes to the efficiency with which your cells are able to remove the genetically predisposed efficiency with which your cells are able to remove oxidants or deal with oxidants. Said simply, your cells are genetically masterfully designed to deal with the redox reaction within your mitochondria. What am I specifically referring to here? Number one, Greg, one of the most important cellular antioxidative, and by the way, detoxifying pathways as well, and those two things are not mutually exclusive, is the glutathionization pathway. How your cells use glutathione, that amazing little tri-amino acid peptide that is one of the most important detoxifying agents in the body, as well as the most ubiquitous antioxidant in the cells of your body. There are enzymes that need to use glutathione to do the job of antioxidizing things, including the oxidants that will be churning out when you are an ultra high performer. You have, these genes are called the GST genes, the glutathione S transferase genes. And without getting too much into the minutiae, what we will say first at this level of answering your question, 
your compendium, when we looked at your entire glutathione transferase family and the versions of the genes of that family that you have, you score in the elite of the elite in terms of the efficiency of the enzymes encoded by those genes. So to summarize quickly, glutathionization is the cell's most important or one of the most important antioxidative pathways and detoxifying pathways, period. Greg's versions of the genes that dictate, that control, that direct how his cells are going to deal with oxidants, he is in the elite of the elite of humankind. Then we went deeper. We looked at his redox reactions within his mitochondria. We looked at his mitochondrial superoxide dis dismutase. We looked at his glutathione peroxidase, how therefore, how efficient, not just within the cytoplasm of the cell, but we went into the mitochondria, the batteries of the cell, the little nuclear power plants of the cell. This is where we're churning out those ATP molecules for energy. But as we said earlier, when you make energy, you must. It's a law of physics. You cannot create energy except you're going to create a byproduct. You're going to create a waste product, in this case, oxidants. And how good are Greg's cells, i.e. how good are his mitochondria designed to handle the oxidative load of being an ultra athlete? Again, you score in the elite of the elite when we looked at all of these genes. So the first part to the answer to your question and to your audience, whoever wondered, wow, how can these human beings subject themselves to the type of rigors of ultra athleticism as you have and others of your ilk? This is one of the key genetic components. It's not just about, you know, are your muscles firing faster? And there are a lot of gimmicky things out there. We're getting to the core. Functionally, your body, your cells, your muscle cells must be able to deal with that oxidative stress in the way you can, if you are going to survive as an ultra athlete, as you have survived and as you have excelled. This is the very first point, Greg. Well, that makes, well, that makes I like, sense. I like, the I, first, like the first, I like the first point. Like the first point. <laughs> okay. Now let's get to the second point. And here in the second point, we're going to shift gears. Because in the second point, I must admit, this is one of the things that I did not predict at all. But this is one of the things, somewhat surprisingly, and then by the end of dozens of dozens of the, you know, the top of the top athletes, the repeatedness of this phenomenon shocked me. What is this phenomenon? It is the phenomena that you, and for your audience, I'm speaking here of Greg specifically now, but I'm saying that this thing that I'm going to tell you about Greg was a repeated feature of the genetic makeup of particularly ultra, these, these athletes that are engaged in ultra marathon, ultra athleticism, those extreme type of sports. What is it? It is that, Greg, your brain is typically operating on a deficit of dopamine. You see, we produce dopamine, Greg, you know, the average rank and file human beings, we produce dopamine in response to, we know it as the pleasure neurochemical. And so when we engage, whether it's in that strawberry cheesecake, whether it's in seeing your beautiful spouse, whether it's in seeing your, you know, angelic little children doing something that is pleasurable. When we do something that is pleasurable, our peripheral senses of touch, smell, taste, sight, and sound, we perceive that environment, that presumptively pleasurable environment, and our peripheral neurons send these signals to the prefrontal cortex of the brain, the pleasure center of the brain, known as the nucleus accumbens. And when the nucleus accumbens receives these peripheral neuropathic stimuli, assuming that they're associated with pleasure, that part of the brain secretes dopamine. Now, the secreting of the dopamine isn't yet pleasure. It's the first step toward pleasure. And this is happening in milliseconds, nanoseconds, actually. So for me, when I know my wife has gone out shopping and she's promised to bring me that New York strawberry cheesecake with that, you know, undercoating of Graham cracker that I die for, <laughs> when she walks in the door and I hear the crinkle of that little plastic shell that holds the strawberry, even before I taste it, hearing the noise of the shell, then smelling it, then seeing it, I'm in la-la land, much less for tasting it. Now, so we produce dopamine. 
The second step towards pleasure is we've got to be able to bind that dopamine, okay? And then the third step that we don't think of is, you know, if you or anyone in the audience were to shout out, you know, two nights ago, whatever caused you pleasure, well, don't do that, Greg, but just keep it to yourself. <laughs> whatever you did that was pleasurable two nights ago, you're still not basking per se in that pleasure. And you certainly, Greg, are not. You see, because when we secrete dopamine in response to that pleasurable stimulus and the dopamine is binding to its receptors, that's when we experience the Matthew McGonaghy, all right, all right, pleasure moment. At the same time, literally at the same time that's happening, your brain is producing enzymes, yes, enzymes in your brain that will, be, that will neutralize the dopamine so as to bring you back down to terra firma, to bring you back down from that high. Okay, so now let's assemble what we found for Greg. First things first, we ask, those receptors, those docking stations in the nucleus accumbens of, of Greg's brain and all of our brains, okay, there are these special receptors, these special docking stations known as dopamine receptors. And guess what? Greg's brain has a sparser distribution of these receptors. Literally, genetically, in Greg's nucleus accumbens, he's not expressing the highest level of these receptors, which means when he does something pleasurable and dopamine is produced, they don't have as many docking stations for which to bind to, which of course is when we then experience pleasure. So immediately, Greg's intensity of his pleasure response, were he to do the rank and file normal things in life that will produce normal, you know, spurts of dopamine, that's not going to quite rock Greg's boat. <laughs> but it goes one huge step beyond that. You know those enzymes that are produced to then clear away the dopamine so that once you have the you have the intensity of pleasure, but then you have the duration. How long are you staying in that thrilled, in that pleasurable, in that lala mode? Well, the two most important enzymes in the brain that does this job are catechol-methyltransferase, COMT, and MAO, monoamine oxidase. And these two enzymes and the genes, the self-named genes that make these enzymes come in different versions. There is a slow version to the enzyme, a medium speed version of the enzyme, and a very fast version of the enzyme. And there are two of them, and each of these enzymes have those admixtures. Well, it turns out that for both of these enzymes, Compton MAO, Greg has the fastest possible version. So when Greg, so, so here it comes, Greg, and I think you know, your wonderful spouse needs to know this about you. <laughs> When you do something that's pleasurable or you are engaged in something that's pleasurable, number one, the intensity, the places that your dopamine has to bind in your pleasure center of the brain, it's sparser. You have fewer dopamine receptors. But number two, and more importantly, in some ways, the speed at which you clear, the speed at which you hit the reset button so that you remove dopamine from the brain, you're in the fastest possible category. You have the fastest version of COMT and the fastest version of MAO. So let's put it together, which is what I made the comments somewhat lightheartedly, but I meant it when I said, if you were relying, Greg, on sort of the regular Joe, you know, things in life, to give you that sense of pleasure, to give you that sense of fulfillment, you probably, it wouldn't cut it for you. You need to keep doing, and whatever it may be, and here's the point, Greg, this did not have to be athleticism. It could have been something else that might not have actually been in your favor. But whatever it is that you put your mind to, pun intended, that you go, I'm going to do this for pleasure, you're not going to do it by halves. You're going to be doing it all the way. And this sense, this, this neurochemical skew towards a need for the more extreme, towards a need for not the little things in life, we've got to go all in. This signature that I've just described to you, the signature that is both you do not bind dopamine very, you know, at the density 
that we might otherwise see, and you certainly clear your dopamine much faster than the average Joe, that combination first and foremost defines you. And it is, again, one of those common yet initially not predicted things we see in ultra-athletes, Greg. Mm. Uh, can I can I interrupt your train of thought Please. just real quickly? And Please. now that we have this this result and specifically okay so we've talked about my my glutathione being being somewhat special but now my my deficit of dopamine and then like how how you um how you put it that i i cleaned it away quickly as well and it doesn't have receptors and all of that what can i can i do anything about that what am i take how can i move forward and absolutely absolutely well there's the first there is the intuitive there is the thing that you've learned there's the thing that you have done adaptively and then you can tell me greg and you can tell the audience if that hits the mark and that is again you don't approach anything in life half you know half caught <laughs> well, you, 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 you know every time i fill out one of those uh, random little facebook things it says are, are you a, a psychopath or something <laughs> <laughs> I'm always surprised it says I'm a psych I'm a psychopath or something. I'm like, no. Now I know I've just got poor dopamine <laughs> receptors. I just so, need to get so, it more so that, that, that sense, that adaptive quality in you that you know that the sort of defines how you perceive the world and what you need to do. Because again, at the end of the day, we all want some of that fulfillment. And it's just about are we getting it more easily or do we have to do more to get that? And that's, of course, where you fall into. So, okay, so there is, when you ask me what can we do about it, the first of it is the intuitive adaptation that some people find and you happen to find it in the way you've positioned and you've focused yourself on your sports. Now, as, as, as I said earlier, if you had discovered that food or certain foods were what, you know, gave you that excess pleasure that you were searching for. We see the signature in individuals that become addictive eaters. We see the signature in people that are addictive to gambling or addicted to other things that people are addicted to. So just FYI, the same signature, what I'm trying to say here, Greg, is you have found that adaptation to your lifestyle and to your life's purpose. That is one of the things we can do to address this, number one. Number two, at a more if we would call operational level, one of the things that we found that individuals like you respond quite well to is the amazing and the remarkable nutraceutic, or it's, it's actually not a nutraceutic, actually, it's a natural product of the brain known as SAMine, s adenosylmethionine And what we find is s adenosylmethionine which by the way in Europe, uh, Greg, is actually used as a first-line treatment for depression. Now, in America, we can actually get SAMI from the health food stores. We can get it online. We can get it from functional doctors without a prescription. What is SAMI? So SAMI, without getting into all of the details, it's the end product of methylation in the cells. It's how our cells store methyl donors. And methyl donors are incredibly important in how we perform numerous cellular reactions, so bringing it home, SAMI seems to stabilize and make more efficient the presence of dopamine where it matters, i.e. in the brain, in the nucleus accumbens. And so speaking to a healthcare provider, of course, I'm speaking here generically, but when we find these rapid dopamine clearers, especially rapid dopamine clearers combined with weaker dopamine binding, when these individuals discover a healthy, you know, relationship with SAMI as, 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 as a supplement, as a nutrient that they can take, it can be life-changing. So that's all the way on the other end of a very functional, operational thing that can be life-changing for people with your genetic profile. Nice. Thank you. How do you spell that, SAMIN? So it's in the shorthanded version is capital S, capital A, capital M, small e. And what it spells out is S- Adenosyl methionine. S. Adenosyl methionine. Just a quick mini break before we get back to the show. I just want to remind you guys to go check out athleticgreens.com forward slash Greg. Sign up and get your free 20 daily travel packets with your first order of $79 added value. That's athleticgreens.com forward slash Greg. All right. Well, 
you've you've start you've come out with a with a big swing. <laughs> I've got some positives and I've got some. There we it, go. It's, it's like I feel like all of us, uh, anybody that does this test, is going to have things that they can feel like. Yeah, I knew I had something really special about me, and then oh yeah, I kind of knew I had that as well. I mean, that must be what you see across the board that people come in and. and you know, we're all human, right? We all have these these special genes and then we all have these genes that are like, eh, you know. <laughs> Absolutely. Absol- and the thing here, J- Greg, is that this is never meant to be fatalistic, not in the least. No. I mean, for the people that are listening to you and they know who you are, they know not just your athleticism, but your just just the humanity of you and, you know, your awesomeness as a human being. Here, we, we know we've given you two, as you said, we come out swinging. We've given you two aspects of your genetic makeup. But even if one of those aspects might have been perceived, and it's really not, everything in your genetics that you can think of that might be perceived, for the most part, that might be perceived as a negative, believe it or not, Greg, they're going to be, there's a yin-yang, they're going to be positivity, they're going to be things, I mean, there's a reason that some of these versions of these genes have existed and have stayed in the human population for millennia. Mm. If they were altogether always bad, of no benefit to the human being, <laughs> these versions of the genes will not be persisted. They will die out, isn't it? Yeah, it's fascinating. Well, can, can we move on? What, what do you, um, I was hey. thinking, you know, musculature or, or vas- vascular or, or, yes. or, or some of that kind of stuff. Let's have a look but at now that. Now we go from... The thing that we said earlier, the oxidative capacity that we predicted, we predicted that we would see or likely see, and that was proven to be true, as we did with you. We did not think of the behavioral component, so that one surprised us, but then when we sort of realized and when we spoke to more and more athletes and they said, you know, yeah, if I get injured and I can't, and I miss a season or, you know, whatever the case might be, I can really feel my mood taking a hit because you're not fueling the thing that you have intuitively or you've found that gives you that pleasure. Okay, so those are those two things. The third thing that we want to address, this is where I had initially put my money and if I was a betting man, I'd be a pauper right now because (laughs) I would have lost my bet on this one. And again, Greg is a perfect example of why I would have lost my bet. You see, Greg, and I've seen you by picture, and we, we had a brief video interaction, so I've seen your neck up. I've actually never seen your body, not that I want to see your body, but <laughs> I do see you. Okay, so, so here's the point, beyond the lightheartedness. I don't know what you look like, but I would make this prediction about your physiology, meaning your, your stature, your frame, your muscle tonicity. Of course, I would cheat, and I know that clearly is a ultra athlete, you're going to likely be, you know, fairly slim, you're going to be fit, and so on and so forth. And so that would be a fairly, you know, easy thing to assume. But here's what I know about you, Greg, based on your genetics, that would be counterintuitive to what I know about your career path. And that is, Greg, you're the type of individual that with your musculature, it's a use it or lose it. You see, Greg, Getting that lean, striated, six-pack muscle frame is not necessarily something that you can keep very easily. And I'm, I'm putting myself out on a limb here. When I look at your genetic profile, your genetic profile is not one. It is not an ultra androgenized profile. The capacity that you have to make your testosterone and then make your dihydrotestosterone and the balance of that versus your estrogens, for example, you are not genetically a very androgenized from a musculature perspective individual. You can be lean and you will likely be lean, obviously, as the athlete and the way you live your life. But the ease with which you can build those biceps and if you wanted to, you know, if you wanted to put on some muscle mass, it's not going to be the easiest thing for you. Am I correct? I I think I think yes you're correct in terms of being reasonably lean. So my sport was triathlon and 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 I you know did that for for many many years as the listeners would know. Um I wasn't probably the leanest of of triathletes. In fact, one of my early coaches said I was built more like a rugby player and and <laughs> uh and that's my family sport, you know, it was uh, yeah. definitely my my brother was a professional rugby player. So 
not to that would have been my sport had I been able to put on you know a decent muscle bulk in my in my teenage years and in fact I, I didn't develop uh, in, until much later than that I would say now because I'm not focusing heavily on aerobic activity I, I yes. you know I, I'm now my, my goal once retiring was to try and be somewhat of a normal man and have some, <laughs> some musculature and you know be able to lift things and and now my workout is very much focusing on you know I'm a, I'm a dad of two you know I'm a 48 year old man but I have a, a two year old and a, and a seven month old and so now my working out is all about longevity and being able to lift the kids and play with the kids so it's a very yes. different kind of strategic working out I, I work out for 30 to 40 minutes each day one day it's you know fairly heavy weights in, in the gym and the other day is kind of more vo2 work sort of running and then I do some underwater work you know swimming um, but otherwise you know, my, my training is limited these days. What I was surprised was when I got back into the gym, I quickly did put on some muscle. Now that's relative to being, you know, at the time I weighed, when I was racing, I was weighing 152 pounds or whatever, so 68 kilos. And what now, frame, Greg? And what's that height that went with that? Yeah. So just under six foot. Right. Um, and then, uh, what is that in centimeters? I think I'm 181 centimeters or something. Mm -hmm. Then now, when I'm really not working out as much, and I'd like to say it's all muscle, but <laughs> I'm, I've been retired here a few years from professional racing, and there's definitely a, a layer of fat there that, that keeps me warm. But I think uh, now I would say I'm probably around that 178 pounds, Right. Um, which uh, in kilos must be around 76, 77 kilos, I think. Um, probably, probably put on about 10 kilos since race weight right. um, in, in muscle. Now, I don't plan or intend to want any more muscle than that. So it's kind of, you know, now I'm like, okay, now I, I wouldn't mind just leaning down a little bit. <laughs> and, uh, right. But but I think I think what you're saying is right. I think when I even look at my brother who was, had all the athleticism in the family, and when I mean athleticism, he could turn on a dime, he could, he was broad, he could tackle a, a Maori at full speed on the rugby pitch, um, you know, just, just an incredible athlete. Right. I ended up going to endurance sports because I didn't have that turn of speed. I didn't have that power. And to be quite honest, I was scared shitless of tackling guys twice my size. <laughs> <laughs> but but I uh, but it, 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 that was probably what drew me in to endurance sports. Um, you know, I was desperate to be a rugby player, but just absolutely playing and in the thirteen E's didn't do it for me. So, <laughs> so to clarify with, with yourself or with the audience here, here we're not speaking about the inability to put on muscle mass per se. We're speaking of the way that you're able to cut that muscle mass. So that are you able when you put on this muscle mass now in the way that you exercise? And of course, by the way, these insights, these genetic insights will dictate that how could we biohack? So let's just break this down to the audience a little bit. What were we looking at to make these assertions about Greg's, how his body will perform? What we've looked at here, Greg, is we've looked at in males and females, okay, we are going to produce our testosterone from progesterone. Of course, that's why it's progesterone, it's the progenitor. And one gene and its incumbent and its encoded enzyme, CYP17A1, is the enzyme that will convert progesterone and pregnenolones into the androgens. And you've got the quote-unquote slow version of that gene, which actually is all relative. And the slower version of CYP17A1, which is what you have, is actually deemed the normal, the, the somewhat advantageous version. So, okay, that's not the issue there. Now, when you make your testosterone, a second gene with its enzyme steroid 5-alpha reductase is what converts that testosterone into dihydrotestosterone, DHT. Now, one molecule of DHT has the androgenicity potential of six molecules of testosterone. In other words, mm. DHT, dihydrotestosterone, binds to the androgen receptors, which of course is how the androgens, the testosterone, the DHT, influence your cell's behavior, okay? One molecule of DHT has a greater potency for that androgen receptor than testosterone. You've got the slowest version of steroid 5-alpha reductase. Again, not an issue. But what it means is when we look at that compendium, when we look at the rate at which you convert progesterone into testosterone, 
And then the further rate at which you convert testosterone into DHT, you're not at the extreme level. You're not at the level where had we had the faster CYP17A1 and the faster or fastest steroid 5 r reductase, these would be the individuals that they're just, they're cut. They get that cut. I call them the Jason Statham look. Mm. Okay. And so that's not where you're at. And that's where, that's the first uh, conclusion. That's the first assertion. You're not over on that extreme. Well, we got to fix that one. <laughs> <laughs> what do we do? What do we do? <laughs> so, so, you know, one of the only things, I mean, and, and again, this is beyond, we're not going to step into, not, not for the purposes of this interaction at least, into, you know, any steroidal supplementation or things like that. Let's leave that for the side for the time being. One of the things that we these individuals do find they need to do well how do androgens impact a cell? And by the way, how does androgen, how does testosterone or DHT for that matter, what is it doing? You know, we, we, we think of, okay, those are your male hormones or your androgenizing hormones. Well, many individuals don't understand how hormones do what they do. And well, how they do what they do is your testosterone or your DHT will bind to these docking stations there, those receptors again, mm -hmm. on the surface of the cells, including your muscle cells. And then that receptor that has now been bound by your floating, your, 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 the androgens in your bloodstream, then that receptor leaves the surface of the cell like a Star Trek module. It's going to disassociate from the surface of the cell and it's going to go into the cell, into the nucleus, turning on and turning off genes that confer onto the cell a more androgenized, greater metabolic rate. It does things to the cells that creates the androgenicity of the physiology of that cell and of the tissues and of the muscles. Okay, so we just found out that Greg, he's not at that extreme end of producing these androgens to bind to these receptors in the first place. Okay. What can he do about this? Again, as we said, putting aside any uh, augmentation, artificial augmentation, the type of exercises that you do, Greg, and the intensity with which you do those exercises forces or causes your muscles and actually your cells in general to produce even more androgen receptors. So here is an epigenetic phenomenon. When you exercise and you tax your muscles, because those muscles need the androgenicity to perform, when you perform, regardless of whether you've got tons and tons of androgens in you, what you're doing is you're forcing those cells to produce more docking stations, more receptors, so that your cells, your muscles become more efficient at using whatever they have at their disposal. So the short answer to your question is, you've been doing exactly what you need to do. Now, as you get a bit older, of course, your weight-bearing exercises, you know, especially those power-type exercises, depending on the muscle groups that you want to encourage, you want to get those muscle groups beyond their native capacity in terms of your not extreme androgenicity, your power lifting, your deadlifts, your, your, your lunges, your squats, depending on the muscle groups that you want to exercise, when you exercise those muscle groups intelligently and purposefully, you induce them to produce more receptors and they thereafter become more efficient at using even the lower levels of androgens. Make sense? Yes, it does. Now, if, if I was to simplify it, is that would that be like talking about slow twitch versus fast twitch? Muscles. Not quite, not quite. So fast twitch, slow twitch muscles, that will dictate the muscle groups that are involved in the different movements. Regardless of the muscle group and regardless of slow twitch or fast twitch muscle groups, they will need to bind androgen. So when I talk about here, you know, the type of exercises, you may think that I'm preferring, you know, your power-based muscle groups. I'm not really saying that it's it's powerlifting versus speed training or endurance training. I'm saying any training for your muscle groups will induce those muscle groups and the different types of muscles to express more androgen receptors, which is the biohack when a person isn't producing enough androgens to begin with. 
fine. Mm. But I'm just saying as we get older, some of these larger muscle groups, those glutes and so on and so forth, those quads, they, they tend to, you know, not waste away, but they're the ones we tend to lose sooner. And in an individual like you, when you've got that little thing where you're not naturally producing a lot of your, you know, testosterone and thereafter DHT, working those big muscle groups will be in your best advantage. Mm. Mm. That's fascinating because it would have you would have thought going hand in hand with being a professional athlete was the ability to produce the testosterone and have the receptors there. So that 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 is interesting. And did you find when you've worked with other athletes? Uh, on the endurance side that that was a trait that a lot of endurance athletes have or is that a trait that I just have? Brilliant. And that's what we said earlier. So there were some things we I naively predicted that I would see a preponderance of the more androgenized phenotypes. And I would say this way, this is one of those that just did not reach statistical significance. In other words, it did not seem to be a determining factor. We neither saw a preponderance of androgenicity or a preponderance of non-androgenicity, as the case might be. I would have hung my hat that I would have seen a preponderance of androgenicity, but that's not what we saw. So in other words, you having the profile that you do, which isn't the innately designed, you know, cut and just, you know, there's that six pack, there's that lean tricep cut, that that ease with which the body, the, the muscle striation is what, is what I'm speaking of here that won't be as easy for you. We do not see that as a commonality per se amongst uh endurance athletes mm, it makes sense i tried so hard to be cut for the last 30 years that's why i trained so so hard in the end i got a couple of good results along the way but all i wanted to do was being lean <laughs> and be cut i'm just kidding um what, what about um vascular if we look at the heart right. and, and, and everything else so now of course we go to the fourth of the categories of things that we put them there as, as, as prototypes of the human body that we were trying to make predictions on. As you might imagine, that vascular health is something we clearly wanted to see or we expected to see as a standout. And you do stand out in this regard. Now, one of the things I do want to point out here is I think you know well and those in your ilk there can be exceptional athletes that outwardly look exceptionally fit and, and they hit all of the you know objectives that they want to move toward. But we know that there are those very sad occasions where we get sudden death syndromes in athletes. So just because an athlete is outwardly of the finest specimen does not mean that inwardly his vasculature, those amazing miles and miles of vascular pathways are the healthiest. And of course, this is one of those places we see these sudden death, or one of the causes we see for sudden death uh, syndromes in athletes. Mm. Coming to Greg, however, actually, Greg, one of the most, uh, w- one of the stronger, when we look at pathways that predict longevity, so now we move here from beyond just athleticism mm. to simply health, the, 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 the traces, the cellular processes that we would like to be as optimal as possible. And when they are as optimal as possible, we tend to see these as hallmarks of individuals that tend to be, you know, live longer, healthier lives. There are a couple of them. The first is that super duper antioxidative mitochondrial function that you have that already predicts that bodes incredibly well for longitudinal health. The second thing here are certain aspects of your vasculature and you have it. What is it that I'm speaking of? There's an incredibly important gene, the APOE gene, A-P-O-E gene. And this gene, Greg, is one of the most studied genes. It's, It's infamy, its claim to fame is that it is the most studied gene in the realm of late onset Alzheimer's disease. So this gene got its, its, its fame because this gene comes in three different versions. There is a version two, a version three, and a version four. Now, of course, you're going to have two copies of this gene. The version four of this gene, Greg, that's the version you don't want if you had a say in the matter. The version three is the norm. 60, 70% of human beings are APOE33s, depending on ethnicity. 
the version two of this gene is quite rare. And a person who has the combination of an APOE2, three, one of the APOE genes is the version two, the other is the version three, this unique APOE2, three combination, a few things. They are exceptionally protected from age-related dementias, particularly Alzheimer's disease. Let's just cut through the chase and not keep you waiting. Euro 2, 3, Greg. So just by the way, you have this rare, super protective version of this super important gene that bodes extremely well when it comes to protecting you from age-related dementias. And it also bodes exceptionally well, and by the way, it's not mutually exclusive, for vascular health. And as we know, vascular health or optimal vascular health is one of the safeguards from dementias, including Alzheimer's disease. To to sort of summarize that, Greg, when it comes to your vasculature, starting with this gene, but also then going to other peripheral functional components, you score extremely well. Mm. Well, that's that's good to know. I, I think I feel like we're going up and coming down. This is like a roller coaster. <laughs> I love it. Um, I was wondering, what about the brain? I know when we I listened to Laura's, and you described in hers, and and forgive me, listeners, but if I get this wrong, but basically her BDNF, uh, the brain derived nootropic factors. Um, hers, basically, you encouraged her to write down notes. <laughs> and I mean, I'm, I'm simplifying everything and I'm sorry about that. What are, is there something related there that you can talk to me about yeah. my brain well, or how that works? And when we chatted briefly uh, uh, a couple of weeks ago ahead of this podcast, um, you, you found that fascinating. <laughs> I remember when you listened to it, you said, my gosh, that was definitely one of the things that explained your better half. Mm. And you were wondering because you felt that there were some differences there between you and her. And to clarify, so this gene, the BDNF gene, the brain-derived neurotrophic factor gene, there is a particular variation in that gene making the gene come in two versions. In other words, there is a SNP so that there are two alleles of this gene. There is the G allele, George allele, and the A alpha allele. The A allele of this gene is associated with lower levels of BDNF, okay? And certainly, Laura had, you know, she genetically, she was predisposed to the lowest levels of BDNF, such that there were noteworthy characteristics we would find. For you, and I will explain those briefly. To clarify, Greg, you actually are heterozygote, so you're not a complete GG. You do carry, you do carry one of the lower level, lower one of the alleles that would predispose you to lower levels of BDNF. You may find this somewhat surprising, but you have to, con- from a behavioral perspective, you've got to contextualize your lower levels of BDNF with that extreme skew of your Compton MAO, as well as with your ADRA 2B. Now, let's break this down quickly. So, BDNF, that neurotrophin in the brain, is the thing that it helps the brain rewire itself. So, it helps the brain when we stumble, when we have our little glitches. Think of BDNF as the food that allows your neurons to reconnect and rewire so that what? We can say this way, when a person has the lowest levels or predisposed to the lowest levels of BDNF, they can sometimes get stuck on the small things. It's as though the brain cannot find the rewired pathways to get over those emotional glitches or those things that they're, you know, when something gets under your skin. Mm. Okay. Now, to be clear, you're not going to be predisposed to the lowest levels of BDNF, but I did want to point out, you're also not genetically predisposed to the highest levels of BDNF. Mm. However, you see, we can't just, and this is functional genomics at its best, so we now understand this about you. As a side note, whether you have the lowest levels of BDNF or not, let's put it this way, so long as you don't have the optimal levels of BDNF, Greg, One of the last things you want is a concussion. Mm. 
So you know that movement that you went away from that good old Australian rugby was probably one of the best decisions you made in your life. Except I've had 33 bike crashes in my career oh, okay. and have been knocked out many, many times. Okay. <laughs> and I've just been told I had a, a Dr. Tommy Wood on recently and he's uh, he's working very hard with um, pediatric brain health. And uh, one of the big things that's come out that he mentioned to me was, you know, get on – Creatine, they're, they're yes. saying creatine is, oh. is huge. So go on, go on. I didn't mean to stump you with that. No, but yes, no, I've had no, quite no. a few concussions. <laughs> so, you know, you've got to be, you know, you've got to take, especially for, now mind you, we had those other factors that will protect you of your excellent vascular health, but ensuring that you maintain that neural plasticity, which is dramatically impacted by concussions, is something that you want to focus on. Mm. Beyond creatine, some of the best work for post-concussive uh, nutraceutic intervention is on tocotrienol. So I would encourage you to look at the amazing work that tocotrienols, tocotrienols, the E3, as different from tocopherols. Look at tocotrienols and the amazing work that has been done in post-concussive, post-brain trauma recovery, something that alongside creatine, you should probably Can, can you spell that for me? So, so toco, T-O-C-O, trienols, T-R-I-E-N-O-L-S, trienols. Okay, it's one of the fractions of the vitamin E family, which has had fame and infamy, but the studies on vitamin E, they all focused on the tocopherols, the E2s, and we forgot about the E3s. So the E3s, the tocotrienols, are what has been shown, and we don't typically get a lot of that in the diet, depending on what we eat, the palm fruit, which is why Malaysia is one of the largest producers of tocotrienols, uh, can be extracted from the palm fruit. By the way, Greg, on the, you know, after this call, I can, I can put you in touch with a very, very good supply of tocotrienols. Oh, perfect. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, now, just to quickly tie in there to indicate why there is the behavioral difference. And as you had said, you know, you, you know, when you looked at the difference between your beautiful better half and yourself, that you don't necessarily find that getting stuck as easily mm. or getting that emotional rut or getting, you know, in, in that hamster wheel emotional toil as easily. And this is actually because, Greg, two things. Those same enzymes that you have the super fast version of, the Compt and the MAO, not only do they neutralize dopamine, they neutralize noradrenaline. And noradrenaline is the neurochemical that causes us that anxiety, that worry, that woe. Noradrenaline is the thing that at the end of the evening, especially if you had too much of it and it was staying too long, and you had low BDNF would be the thing that would have you kind of going, and she said that to me, and I wish I should have said this, and the rooster was crowing outside, and the kettle was boiling when, you know, we had this awful conversation. You, those Compton MAO, metabolize no adrenaline. So you, if something creates no adrenaline, usually in a worrisome uh, uh, stimulation, the negative emotional valiance stimuli, you neutralize that noradrenaline much faster than the average person. And not only that, the receptor in your brain for noradrenaline, you have the reversion, the noradrenaline receptor, the ADRA2B receptor, your noradrenaline receptor desensitizes very quickly. So in other words, when Greg is faced with negatively emotional valiant stimuli, he's able, his brain is resetting much faster than the average person. Incidentally, Greg, that is, by the way, one of the things associated with sociopaths, but that's a different story. Oh, <laughs> So, a, you know, this has been the podcast to end all podcasts. I love it. <laughs> but, you know, in other words, you, you're not, you know, so so just to point out, we don't just take the BDNF and you would have gone, but you know, man, sir, I don't feel that as much as I saw it relevant in my life. Well, the thing here is the other component of neurologic behavior that you're in quite the extreme of, and you've got to look at how it all comes together. Mm, mm. It, this is absolutely 
Fascinating. Are there any other things that you see? I know I've kept so much of your time. Is no, there, any, is there anything else that you, you, you see on there that kind of stands out? I know these reports are, are long and, and, and I probably need to book in several more hours with you in the future, but is there anything else there that, that stands Absolutely. out? So one of the things that, you know, and, and this is not, it, it, it is way more than what might seem trivial and it is in, exceptionally important in our current environment of COVID and that is, Genetically, you are at extreme risk of suboptimal or inefficient levels of vitamin D. And so if you were not living, and I believe, uh, which is what you mentioned to me in, in preparation for this, you're based in Florida. Yeah, at the moment. Of yeah, course, yeah. you know, one of the better places to be with what I'm about to tell you. So said simply, audience, and for Greg... Greg's genetics make it such that if he were living in a place where four to six months of the year, it was gloomy and it was dark and he was not getting enough sun, he would just not be the best version of himself at all. A, because genetically, and I will quickly describe what that means, you are genetically predisposed to more moderated, lower vitamin D production levels. Said another way, you are genetically designed to flourish in sunnier environments. Does that resonate with you, Greg? Of course. I think being an Australian slash Florida, I think they work like that. Yeah, definitely. Mm. And, and, and the way that we are able to see this, and this is not just, well, is there a gene that makes vitamin D? It goes way, way beyond this. So very quickly for our audience and for our audience that, you know, you, you that are interested in nutraceutics and the drivers behind the nutraceutic things we take. Here's how it goes very quickly. When we are exposed to sunlight, the UVB of the sun, B is in Bravo, initiates a photosynthetic reaction in our dermal cells that produces a vitamin D precursor. Let's be clear, that's not the active vitamin D, it's a vitamin D precursor. That precursor which of course, and there are other factors such as the coloration of one's skin, clothing, level of sunlight, sunblock, and so on and so forth, will dictate how much precursor we're making. Then that precursor is then transported to the liver. This is where the fun starts happening. In the liver, there's an enzyme, CYP2R1, that's going to activate that precursor into our 25 and then 125 dihydroxycalciferol. That's your active vitamin D. We're going to call that simply vitamin D. Greg, you have the slowest version of that enzyme. Slowest, again, is relative. That's not necessarily a bad thing. It just means the rate at which you convert the precursor into the active moiety, into the final vitamin D, is slow, relatively speaking. Mm. Then that vitamin D is fat-soluble. Blood is water-based. So how does the liver secrete a fat-soluble hormone, which, by the way, is what vitamin D is, into a water-based medium, the blood? The way we do this is the body then produces a taxi cab for the vitamin D in order for the fat-soluble vitamin D to be transported into the water-based media of the blood. We've got to encapsulate it in something. This is the vitamin D binding protein. And Greg, you've got a two-seater tuk -tuk taxi cab for your vitamin D. <laughs> your, your, your vitamin D binding protein does not have a very high affinity for the activated vitamin D. So, okay, hold on. Greg isn't activating in the liver the vitamin D at the fastest levels. And then when he secretes it, from the liver so that it can be distributed towards the body, all through the body. His binding capacity taxicab is a low binding capacity. And then further, by the way, once the vitamin D arrives at your cells, all the cells of the body, it doesn't just diffuse into the cell. It has to bind, again, here, one of those receptors. The vitamin D has to bind to one of these docking stations, the vitamin D receptor, before it can be taken into the cell. Well, Greg, you've got a lower affinity vitamin D receptor. So on all three accounts, from the rate at which you activate your vitamin D, to the efficiency with which you transport in the blood your vitamin D, to the efficiency with which you uptake your vitamin D into your cells, they're all in the lower end, genetically predisposed. So one of the things here, Greg, and for the audience members listening, 
Just recognize what I just said. There are three permutations and combinations, three layers that as human beings, we've got to ask, how efficiently are we activating the vitamin D? How efficiently are we thereafter transporting it? And thereafter, how efficiently are we absorbing it into our cells? Each step is genetically variable, one person to the next. So Greg, for that one, it really is going to be life's geography. You know, where do you... Where do you thrive more than other places? Lifestyle, how much healthy and, of course, healthy sun exposure are you getting? And then, mind you, if and when you know that it's, you know, you're indoors more than you would like or the weather doesn't permit or the season doesn't permit, then you, Greg, have to be a person that watches their vitamin D levels and supplements accordingly. Mm, that's fascinating, all of that. It's, I told somebody the other day that I hadn't had a winter in, in 27 years uh, because we followed the sun. Being athletes, we, 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 were, we were from 93 all the way through basically um, just following summer. And there's been moments where, you know, we, we spent some time in winter and, and I enjoy a week or two, but it was really, and when I say winter, I mean the proper winter with snow and the whole sure. like, cold and all of that stuff. And, and, and you can ask anybody that knows me knows that I'll just complain nonstop for that <laughs> entire time. So uh, it, it's fascinating for me on that one. And I believe uh, uh, that my wife, Laura, is the same. So I, I think that is good. And, and um, I know that we had both our kids tested too. So I'll be interested to see what their results are. Uh, I would assume, how does that work actually? When I Now that I've got you, we, we've had both our kids, we got their saliva done and we, we're kind of waiting to hear their results. Now, if you have my result and Laura's result, does it is it as simple as that? Or do, are we looking at grandparents and how far do we look to see how the genes work? Brilliant, brilliant. Um, and so there are, it will depend on the combination of the genes and I'm gonna describe that to you very quickly. There are times where by simply knowing both parents, we know with a firm, we, we can affirm, we know with certainty what the child's version of that gene is. So for example, if there is that, if there was the uh, Compt gene of which you're a GG, okay, so that means we know that Greg can only contribute the G version of that gene, the Compt gene, for that particular variation that we look at. There is a G version and an A version. Greg's a GG, so all of his little sperm, they only have the G version in it. Mm. Now, if your wife, without getting into her results for the confidentiality of it, but let's just say she too was a GG, well, in that circumstance, her eggs will only ever be Gs, which means that I didn't need to look at your children's genes for that single gene, mind you, because we will know that all of your biologic children would be GGs as well. Mm. On the other hand, if your wife was, for the comp gene, an AA, uh, the other homozygote, then all of her eggs will only ever be As. All of your sperm will only ever be Gs, which means all of your biologic children will only ever be heterozygous, GAs, because they can only get the G from you, get the A from mom. Mm. It is when the parents for a given gene have an admix, they are heterozygous, for example, of that gene. Now we get into the that Punnett square, where we get the combinations, 50% of your sperm might have had the G version, 50% of your sperm might have had the A version, 50% of the eggs might have had that version, the other version, and then we've got to look at permutations and combinations. So for some genes, some genotypes, we can predict outright what the child will be. And for others we have, we say, well, look, the child will have a 50% chance of being a GA, a 25% chance of being a GG, and a 25% chance of being an AA. That's how it works. Yeah, right. Fascinating. Fascinating. Mate, I, I've kept you on for so long and I really, really appreciate that. And I just want to quickly summarize what you've given me so far. And basically, you got to keep me in the sun like a plant. Uh, I'm going to be healthy and live a long time, but I'm going to struggle to find pleasure throughout that time. I'm uh, never going to be quite lean or cut like, like the man I was hoping to be, and I'm going to be somewhat of a sociopath. So this has been a really fascinating episode. <laughs> Oh my goodness. I thought I was going to leave feeling really good about myself. No, I'm just kidding. This, this has been absolutely um, 
just really, really special and such a privilege, privilege to have you uh, sit for this hour 15 and just take me through all of that. And, you know, my brain is all lit up right now. There's been a lot of information that's come in and uh, I, I really appreciate it. Greg, it's just been such an honor. And, and, and obviously, I know that your audience would appreciate this. The only closing remark that I would make is, this is we're just touching the tip of the iceberg for Greg. And we did this in an unpa- we unpackaged this, obviously, in the medium of the audience. You're talking about things, taking, taking bite-sized pieces, talking about it in a way that I hope was engaging, meaningful, that people can kind of have those epiphany moments and go, oh, I think I might be this version. Oh boy, I know my spouse is that version. Great. (laughs) However, I'm sure that you'll get the lighthearted tone in Greg's comment, and that is, keep in mind, nothing that we discuss is meant to be pessimistic or is meant to be fatalistic. Mm. Everything we discuss, it's what? It returns, we end where we started. What we're looking at is, we're looking at the inherent predisposed physiology of the brain. We're looking at the function. What in your genomic manual, how does your genomic manual predispose you to a particular functionality? We take that knowledge, we look to see how much it has actually manifested, but we then always look to see what can we do epigenetically, lifestyle, nutrition, environment to augment that predisposition to what the more desirable outcome to the degree that we have control to do so. So in conclusion, Greg, what an absolute blast, mate. This has just been, this has just been an absolute honor. Uh, I, I hope that, you know, with, beyond all the depth of knowledge, you know, you and your audience, we can see the epiphanies that can occur. And, you know, you're right, Greg, that a really, this is not, we're reading your operating manual. This is not the stuff of an hour. This is the stuff of, you know, really taking one's time and growing with it and learning from it. Mm-hmm. So it's the stuff that, you know, we can go on for a long, long time mm-hmm. to unpackage this. I totally understand why you've gone into this world. It truly is fascinating for, for my listeners. It's, uh, you know, I often talk about our ability, you know, to, you know, what we think has a direct effect on our physiology. And I'm, a, I'm very curious about visualizing and affirmations and, and all of these kinds of things and the effects that we can have on this. And this, this for me takes it even one step further when, when we, we can really dive deep into the operating manual. And I just think it's been absolutely fantastic. Now, if people want to uh, work with you or follow you or follow your work, uh, what are some of the places that they can go to to, uh, to do this test, um, to maybe work with you, or I believe you've got other people that you also uh, work with? How do, they, how do they go about that? The easiest way is check us out at www.mydnacompany.com. My DNA company.com and you'll find all of the ways to reach us um it's a work in progress you'll have access to me uh, uh greg if you're going to post this maybe somewhere that, that that we can have that information Absolutely. but just just reach out reach out reach out to us we have affiliate clinicians all over the world affiliate health providers that have trained with us so that if you're in a part of you know part of the geography that says it's because of course in this day and age greg we can send kits wherever we want we can do virtual consults so that's not an issue but if you then want to have a local healthcare provider to work with we have affiliates all over the world Mm -hmm. um, that we can connect you to so that'd be the easy way of doing it. Greg. Absolutely fantastic, and I do. I do have. Um, you guys gave me a, a URL that uh, it's called. Like you said, it's www.mydnacompany.com, and then you can go to forward slash products forward slash Greg, and you'll find a Bennett Endurance page there. Um, and I'll put that in the show notes and have a link, so it's very accessible for everybody. I'll also have all the timestamps because um, there's so much wonderful information here. You'll be able to find that at Bennett Endurance com forward slash media um dr mansoor Mohammed. wow what a conversation and it's been a real thrill I, I thank you so much um and thank you everybody for listening thanks a lot for listening to be with champions if you enjoyed the show your support would truly be appreciated you can visit the be with champions patreon page or you can subscribe with your podcast app of choice don't miss the next episode so subscribe and be notified For show notes, if you want to know more, please visit bennettendurance.com. I'm Phil Liggett, and on behalf of Greg Bennett, here's to the next time, and I hope 
You will join Greg again very soon.